Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Hello and welcome back to Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. And today on the line with us from somewhere in the 630 area code, we have Jack Perconti, one of my favorite all-time second bass players, right up there with Billy Martin and Jackie Robinson. I watched Jack a lot when I was living in Bellingham, Washington. He was playing for the Mariners. So Jack Perconti, thank you for taking the time to do with us today. Uh, thanks, Dennis. It's uh, nice to have a fan, that's for sure, and uh, it's great to be here with you. Thank you very much, and you're now a, a writer, and books on uh, leadership, The Road to Success is one of them, but if we can talk baseball for just a moment, um, why did you select that, or did it select you as your preferred go-to activity? Yeah, it pretty much selected me, I guess, because, you know, growing up, I played all the sports, and I uh, found out I wasn't too good at a couple of them, and baseball I kept uh, progressing in, and as I got better, I fell in love with it more and more, and I guess that became my uh, sport of choice. And you uh, throw right and bat left, is that correct? Uh, That's correct, yes. Uh How is that possible? (laughs) Well, yeah, they're two different uh, skills, I guess, and... uh, I, I have no idea. Many people have asked me over the years, how come I batted left-handed? And just from a young age, it's just the way I picked up the bat and held it and swaying. So I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I never did ask my dad if he specifically uh, taught me that way, but it's just the way it is. And uh, yeah, it worked out great. Well, I know there's lots of switch hitters there, but uh, usually if you throw one way, you bat that way. So uh, another reason... A uh, question about baseball before we get uh, really serious is uh, they always seem to, pitchers don't seem to bat much in the major leagues, but usually in high school, aren't they the best players all around? So how come they don't bat in the major leagues that much? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, I don't think they have enough time to probably work on both. Although, you know, Shohei Atani now is kind of proving everybody that it can be done, but it just uh, the skills require so much work, and it's hard to devote. I think to both, and um, you know, once the major league uh, people get a hold of you, they steer you in one direction or the other. So, but once again, we are seeing a little bit of a comeback of the multiple play uh, pitcher and hitter. So maybe that's down the line more. And Jack Perconti is with us. Uh, he was with the Mariners for a while, also Dodgers and the Cleveland team. Uh, do you Have you ever found out why uh, the Mariners suddenly traded you away in the middle of the season? Well, um, yeah, you know, it's. I think they felt they had someone better, and so that's the nature of the business. And, um, yeah, you just, you never really find out the true answers, but... It, it was just, uh, yeah, I felt such a part of the Mariners, so it really hurt at the time. But that's uh, once again, you, you learn to understand the business and you just uh, try to do your best and look for your next opportunity. And then, of course, uh, you went to the Dodgers. Uh, but before that, you were a high school baseball um, outstanding player. You ended up at Murray State University. Where is that? Uh, that's in Kentucky, and uh, I had nowhere else to go, actually, out of high school. I wasn't uh, given any scholarships or anything, so I just took a took a chance on going there, and it uh, it worked out. I, I knew I wanted to get away from home, and I was from the Chicago area. That was, you know, six, seven hours from home, so I just thought it'd be a good place to go, and it was warmer, and I thought, you know, maybe I could make it in baseball there, and uh, things did work out for me. Well, uh, did you ever get your baseball pension? I, I did, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I was very fortunate in that regard, and uh, I, was, I have a pension, and uh, it's you know very very lucky. So, after the baseball, uh, professional baseball, day to day 
career sort of came to a close. Uh, what, what other things or what did you get into after that? Well, baseball was the only thing I really knew. So I, I opened a, a baseball and softball academy uh, back home where I'm, uh, in the area where I'm from, Naperville, Illinois. And uh, I ran that for 19 years and uh, just taught the game to kids and had a lot of dealings with, uh, you know, youth sports all the years. And so that was actually, uh, I found I loved more than playing the game was teaching it to kids. So I was one of the fortunate few, I think, that found something uh, beyond the game that they liked uh, at least as much. So I did that for, and I still do it to this day. I still teach the game of baseball and softball to young young players. So uh, have you noticed uh, any changes in uh, parental behavior over the years uh, with all the students and parents you've run into in the course of the career uh, as an instructor? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it it's way different than when I grew up, that's for sure. And you started to notice it more probably in the mid-90s to early 2000s where the, the travel uh, team, uh, the travel craze started to take over the sports and uh, things really changed quite a bit when uh, travel came along and parents started spending a lot more money for their kids to play. And along with that came the a lot more tension and pressures on kids and everybody. So it, it definitely changed uh, from the uh, when I played growing up and when I start, uh, first started teaching the game. So what advice would you give to parents if, if you could tell them how to behave? <laughs> well, there's no one such thing, one set thing, I guess. There's so many things, but I mean, I guess patience is number one. Um, they they can't really, uh, you know, make a kid a superstar. They can just be an encouraging towards a kid and help them fall in love with maybe a sport, and that's their the best way of going about it. But so often parents put pressure on their own kids. It's just kind of a you know innate that that's going to happen, but they don't realize that they're putting more and more pressure on their kids in the way they act sometimes and. It, it, it becomes a revolving cycle where uh, the tensions build up between the players and the parents, and then it gravitates to the coaches, and pretty soon it's it's not a healthy situation for anybody. And, you know, so many kids end up just burning out because they don't like it anymore. And um, So it, 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 there's no one simple answer, I guess. That's why I wrote a whole book on uh, raising an athlete to help parents maybe uh, do better at maybe keeping the pressure off their kids and making it enjoyable and trying to keep the fun in the games. Well, I know I've heard people such as Wayne Gretzky talk about when he was growing up, uh, you know, he didn't spend 12 months a year on the ice going to classes and schools and road trips and all these kind of things. He played lacrosse in the summer, let's say baseball, got away from the sport, tried different things, kept himself active. And uh, that seems to be missing a lot these days, or, or am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. You know, specialization has taken over most of the sports where uh, parents and kids feel like they have to do one thing year round in order to keep up with the competition. So pretty soon, you know, you have kids just specialize in either the one sport or they're trying to play more than one sport, but they're doing them both or even three sports year round. And pretty soon that would, you know, tear any kid apart, whether that's all they're doing is playing, you know, sports year round. And, uh, I think it, it's contributed to the burnout factor and, uh, all the pressures and uh i often get kids you know come in for a baseball lesson ask them how they're doing and they just came from you know basketball practice and they had a soccer game on top of it so you know i'm getting them after they're totally wore out and it's just it's kind of crazy sometimes. Uh, that's right. Jack Perconti is with us. We've talked a bit about baseball, and now let's switch to books. So the first one that came out was Raising an Athlete. Was that your first book? Well, my first book was actually a hitting book. On, uh, it was called The Making of a Hitter, which I first came out with, and uh, that was to help uh, parents and coaches teach kids 
you know, the fundamentals of hitting. Um, oh. <laughs> and then uh, my second book, which was the same year, actually, was Raising an Athlete, which was, uh, as I mentioned before, a parent's guide to help uh, their, their kids to enjoy sports more. I guess that's the best way to say it. Is there any, uh, like a 30-second uh, tip you can give us from the book that would apply to most people? Uh, which one? The raising raising, an, raising an athlete to start with, yeah. Yeah, I would say um, to, you know, try to, like I say, build the love up of sports into your kids uh, where they love the sport and not put all the pressure on their results, you know. And it, it's, a, it's a matter of having patience so that the kids can develop at their own pace, you know, and everybody every kid does develop at a different rate and so to expect immediate uh, results um is where you know a lot of uh the love of the sport goes out for kids and so just try to keep it fun and um play it with them if you can i think that's also helpful because there's no one kids look up to more and want to please more than their parents so the more you can do it with them but without constant instruction and you know tell them this do this do that just playing with them is is very important well uh, take yourself for example didn't get to the major leagues if you want to say that for until you're what 26 you had a college career so uh you weren't a, an early bloomer let's say lots of people develop like in the early to mid 20s and i'm wondering if a lot of kids sort of get left by the wayside at, at that kind of cutoff point yeah, they really do, and it's way before that. I mean, we're seeing kids as young as 10, 11, 12 that just, you know, quit sports and, uh, completely because of the pressures up until that time that have been put on them by, you know, expectations of being great, you know, from either their parents or their coaches. And so, yeah, we're, we're losing a lot of good athletes uh, at a young age where it just isn't worth it to them anymore. So it's a definite problem in, a, in our society right now. And Jack Perconti, I have to apologize. I've been looking at your website for days. I never scrolled down far enough to see The Making of a Hitter. I thought there was just the three books. So The Making of a Hitter, is that still available out there? Uh, just slightly, you know, it's funny because, uh, since I wrote it, which is now what, 13, 14 years ago, that we, we teach the game so much different now, the fundamentals and, uh, uh, it's just a different teaching process these days. And so the book isn't as pertinent as it was when it first came out. So, um, okay. yeah, so it is. It is available, but even I don't recommend it as much. The mental aspects of the book are outstanding, but once again, the technical aspects are probably things that aren't taught as much anymore. The game has changed, you know, where it's turned into a power game, hitting home runs, whereas back in my day, I was just putting the ball in contact, uh, in play, and, uh, you know, on the ground more. And so it's just a different game now than it was. That's one book. There's also Creating a Season to Remember. Uh, what's that about? Well, that one, yeah, that was a... Uh, I, I wrote for coaches. There's just, there's just not a lot of great coaches out there for youth. And it's not that, you know, parents and coaches uh, don't want to be. It's just they've never been trained. There's a real lack of training to for our coaches uh, out there, you know, and... Uh, when there is training, you know, they have to maybe attend a 20 minute seminar and that's it, you know, and yet they're responsible for teaching kids, you know, not only how to play, but how to handle everything that comes involved in sports, all the adversity and the, the pressure there. And so I wrote a book, uh, creating a season to remember that's, uh, a coaching guidelines and it's very comprehensive. So. I always say it would be a great book for a college course on coaching because it's, it covers every, in my mind, covers every instance that a coach can come across. But it's, uh, it's very good for, once again, for youth coaching and coaching of any age. And how about yourself? What season do you remember the best? <laughs> Um, I guess my years coaching, you know, whenever I, I, I feel like I really made a difference in a kid's life or even in a, a parent's life. And that's also what the book is for, is to 
to help parents um, to feel good about, you know, how they're coaching in the relationship with their kid. But whenever I come across a kid or their parent where I feel like I really changed their uh, attitude and their focus, I, that makes me feel best. So there's a lot of parents out there that after they see me work with their kids, have changed how they approach working with their kids and they see how it works so much better. And it, you know, so that makes me feel the best whenever I can help someone to, you know, just uh, enjoy the games more. Enjoy. I guess that's the secret. Just enjoy it. Have some fun. You're only around once and why worry about little things if you're, you know, 11 years old and you strike out three times in a game, but uh, the pitcher was just uh, on that day or something. Just have fun, forget about it and go on to the next one. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and, you know, I try to tell people all the time that things really in young kids' careers, you know, nothing really matters that much until maybe sophomore year of high school so if a kid can hang in there that that long and keep playing and just getting better each year and play in the high school then that's when things start to really matter so like you said if a kid you know strikes out three times when they're 11 years old i mean it's not really the end of the world or anything like a lot of people think it is well even in today's major leagues if a guy uh you know goes out seven times out of ten, he's a multimillionaire because he'll be getting big contracts with a 300 average. Well, you have that right. And, you know, they can strike out seven of those times and hit one home run and they're still going to get that big contract. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Moving away from baseball a bit, but on to the success trail, learn to win with a marathon runner's mindset. So I take it you're a marathon runner as well. Uh, I am. I've completed 15 marathons now. And, uh, you know, when I started, I, I get two questions a lot. And one was, you know, how did you make the major leagues? And then the other one was, how did you finish all those marathons? And I started thinking about that and realized that the, the path to doing both, uh, accomplishing both were, is, were pretty similar, you know, the things that went into it. So I kind of, you know, detailed all the steps it took me to make the major leagues and uh, finish the uh, tr train and run marathons. And it, it came out into my book, The Success Trail, which just came out a couple months ago. Jack Perconti is with us. You have a website. Uh, can you tell us what it is, please, so all uh, people uh, can go there? Yeah, pretty <laughs> Pretty simple, jackperconti.com, J-A-C-K-P-E-R-C-O-N-T-E.com. And, yeah, it has my books there and the other things. I have a, a blog that I feel is helpful. It's called The Road to Success, and I try to detail, once again, the things that have helped me to become a better person and better athlete. Uh, one more quick question about um, baseball in general training. Up here in a colder climate, well, you don't get the sunny winters in the Chicago area either, I don't think. But what then uh, kids up here, let's say in Saskatchewan, can do in the cold months to train for baseball? Any specific tips or what, what do you think? Uh, you don't necessarily need a lot of room. You know, I talk about that in a, a couple of my books, you know, to work on the skills of baseball for sure. And even any other sport, I would think. But, you know, if you just have a area in your basement or garage and where you have a little bit of room, you can work on the skills, uh, just about any skill in sports uh, uh, year round, you know. So if they are tied up in indoors at times, um, then just, you know, work on your stuff. You know, indoors, you can get a mirror or nowadays everybody videotapes, uh, actions and you can videotape your stuff and, um, you know, analyze it and work on things there. So there's no excuse for if a kid really wants to practice and work on things, um, to, to have the room to do it. Now, of course, you know, I recommend if they can get outside and do something that's much more fun and, uh, better for you probably but when you can't then like I say there's you don't need a whole lot of room to work on things that's Jack Perconti Jack can we have that website one more time it's uh, Jack Perconti.com. Jack Perconti. Perconti is P E R C O N T E. And uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and best of luck to you and your listeners and 
I appreciate it. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, 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 oh.